Hey guys, in this video I'm going to go through the Mathematics Standard 2 Blacktown Boys High School Trial Exam paper from 2020. It's a two and a half hour exam with two sections, the first section being multiple choice with 15 questions and 15 marks and your second section 85 marks of short answer questions. Now you to give yourself about 25 minutes for the first section and about two hours, two hours and five minutes for the remainder. But I've divided the video into chapters so you can just scroll across to the section that you're after. I've also provided a link for this exam in the description below so whether you want to have the paper handy or you want to view it online or just with me at the same time I personally recommend you give the test an attempt first before you check the solutions but we can work through it together as well for the first section question one I've got I've got a circle has an area of 15 square centimeters its radius is closest to so I'm trying to find the radius in this question and I know that the area of my circle is pi r squared and I know that the area in this case is 15 square centimeters so just by straight substitution this leaves me with 15 is equal to pi r squared I'm trying to get r on its own so I'm going to divide both sides by pi so that leaves me with 15 over pi is equal to r squared now I want to get rid of this little square up here so I'm going to square root both sides and that leaves me with 15 over pi is equal to r plugging that into your calculator and you get 2.1850 and so on and that rounds off to 2.2 so a question two sarah's car uses eight liters of petrol to travel 100 kilometers but petrol costs a dollar 50 per liter how far can she drive using 30 dollars worth of petrol let's first start off with figuring out how many liters of petrol she has in the tank so i'm going to do 30 dollars divided by the dollar 50 and that leaves me with 20 liters so she's got 20 liters in the tank now of this 20 liters let's see how many eight liters like groups of eight liters i've got because every eight liters of petrol gives me 100 kilometers worth um, of travel so i'm going to do 20 divided by eight and that leaves me with 2.5 so therefore i can travel 2.5 lots of 100 kilometers so 2.5 times 100 and that's 250 kilometers that i can travel with b Question three, Hugh invests $12,000 in an account paying 4.8% per annum compounded monthly. What is the value of the investment after one and a half years? Well, I have to do a couple of things here. First, I have to change this rate here to per month. Okay, and I need to change the years, the number of terms here into months as well. So I know that my rate is 4.8% per annum. Changing this to a monthly rate, it is we need to divide by 12 so i do 4.8 divided by 12 and that leaves me with 0.4 percent now for n i've got one and a half years this translates to one and a half times 12 which is 18 months now popping that information into your compound interest formula so i know that my future value is equal to my present value open bracket one plus r to the power of n and this is uh, 12,000 times 1 plus 0.4 percent to the power of 18. Now you can plug this percent straight into your calculator or you can plug this into your calculator 12,000 open bracket 1 plus 0 0.004 to the power of 18. Okay let's plug that in and see what we get. $12,894.01 so that rounds up to $12,894. See. All right for question four. John works in a cake shop and based on the sales over two weeks can he conducted a survey of the five most popular cakes. What type of data is this? Well automatically because I'm listing the types of cakes you know that are most popular it's definitely categorical uh it's definitely categorical data so i'm going to eliminate c and d because it's not numeric now the difference between your nominal and in your ordinal is your ordinal is it can be ordered so for example small medium large um uh fit unfit 
very unfit uh, fit unfit very fit okay so in this case because i'm rating it by popularity so you know it could be from your least favorite to your most favorite in this case it is categorical categorical ordinal data question five the graph below shows the cost of producing boxes of chocolate and the income received from their sales Use the graph to determine the number of box boxes that need to be sold to break even. Well, this is really straightforward. So here is where I break even. So how many boxes is that? Three boxes. C. Right, for question six, we have a Pareto chart and it shows the order received by a business for five months. Now, just as a recap for a Pareto chart, my bar graphs okay so all these bar graphs here they represent the frequency and then your line graph represents your cumulative percentage over here on the right so if i want to know what percentage of orders were received in may okay well i'm going to go to may but i'm not concerned with the bar graph i'm concerned with the data represented by the line graph so i go to that point there I'm going to try and draw a straight line across. Okay, that to me sort of looks like about 68. Okay, so it's 68%. Now, this is where the trick is. This does not mean that 68% of the data lies in May. Remember, because this represents cumulative percentage. So I actually have to subtract the data before, which is... 50% okay and so then to find the number uh, then so then to find the percentage of order that were received in May I have to do 68 take away 50 and that leaves me with 18% which is D question 7 a box contains five red marbles and four blue marbles Stella selects two marbles at random with replacement so the key here is that it's with replacement find the probability that at least one of the marbles that Stella selects is red now okay so based on my tree diagram I know I could either select a red marble or a blue and I'm selecting two and then on my second selection I can select a red or a blue and again a red or a blue okay so this is my first selection and here is my second selection now along here I've got a total of nine marbles so in order if I was selecting a red one at first I have a five in nine chance of picking a red first and then for a blue a four in nine now I'm just going to go along this top um this top branch so if i've already picked a re uh with replacement oh, okay so i'm putting it all back in so i will have nine marbles in the basket um upon second selection and there is a five and nine chance of picking the red again and over here there'll be a four and nine and over here five over nine four over nine now the trick here is you need to make sure that all the data here sorry about that it's colors these ones need to add up to one so anything along a branch must add up to one so that could be your guide for whether you know you're on the right track or not with doing these questions but because this question was with replacement that means the marble is going back into the basket so i can have an outcome of red 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 blue blue red or blue blue now I want the probability that at least one of the marbles that seller selects is red. So let's see, that could be this, this, or this one. Okay, so now it looks like I'm striking it off. Either one of those. Or, uh, so the probability of red red is 5 over 9 times 5 over 9. I'm just going across the branch and using the multiplication um, principle here. So 5 over 9 times 4 over 9. And this one here is 4 over 9 times 5 over 9. And then I add them all up. Okay, so then your probability of at least one red would be these three brackets, you know, that I've noted here added up. What I'm actually going to do though is much simpler way and that is I'm going to find the probability of 
blue blue and I'm just going to subtract it from one because I know all my outcomes should add up to one. So it's simply going to be the probability of one minus the probability of blue blue. That saves me the time of trying to work out each one of these. So I'm going to get one minus the probability of four over nine times four over nine, which is one minus 16 over 81. And that leaves me with 65 over 81, which is D. Question 8. The compass bearing of Y from X is north 32 degrees west. What is the compass bearing of X from Y? So the best way to go about this is let's actually see what's going on. So the compass bearing of Y from X, that means X is here, is north 32. So here's Y. North 32 degrees west. Okay, what is the compass bearing of X? x from y okay so now i'm going to draw my compass my, bear, my north south east west you know compass here at y and now i want to determine what this angle here in the blue is okay now from alternate angles i can identify that this one here is also 32 degrees so to find that angle there in blue i simply need to do 180 take away 32 and that leaves me with oh actually this question is not provide uh this an the answer is not in true bearings form it's in compass bearing okay well i actually have enough information to answer this question so it always must be relative to either north or south so they're both along the right track here so this one here it's south and it's heading towards what? It's heading 32 degrees in the easterly direction. So it's C. Question nine. The, the length of a path is measured as 10.0 meters, correct to one decimal place. The absolute error of the measurement is now. In this case, it's not being rounded off to the nearest one nor to the nearest 10 it's being rounded off to the nearest one decimal place so my measure of error is going to be half of that one decimal point so it's going to be half of 0 0.1 which is 0 0.05 meters d question 10 what is the position of town a on the earth's surface oh okay well this is straightforward I can see here. Easy. So it's at 25 degrees east, 35 degrees south. Oh, so, pardon me. Um, uh, 35 degrees south, 25 degrees east. A. Question 11. Jessica solved the following equation but has made two errors in her working out. Which two steps contain an error from the previous line? What I recommend is actually doing the working out yourself and comparing it to um, when you've got questions like these and then compare it to what they've actually got written out. So my first line, uh, so this is not considered my first line, this is the actual equation. So now let's expand that ourselves. So that should give me 10x plus 5 minus 2x minus 6 is equal to 12. Now I'm going to compare 10x plus 5 minus 2x. Aha, there we go. There's our first error. Okay, so I have an error in line 1 for sure. Now let's, based off their carryover, do the next working out. So if she had, well, well not if, now she has line one written out as such. Now let's base top this working out, see if she carried on correctly. So 10x, I'm going to bring the like terms together. So 10x take away 2x is 8x. And then uh, 5 plus 6 is 11 and equal to 12. Okay, this is correct. That one is fine. Again, carrying over. Now, based on 8x plus 11 is equal to 12, let's see if she gets this part right. So she needs to subtract 11 from both sides, and that leaves me with 8x is equal to 1. Does that match up? No, it does not. Here she's got 8x is equal to 23. It's meant to be 8x is equal to 1. So line 3 is also incorrect, leaving me with uh, B as the answer. Question 12. 
The following is the graph of a relationship between two quantities x and y. Which type of function would accurately model this data? Okay, which of the following, uh, the, the following is a graph of a relationship between two quantities x and y. What type of function would accurately model this data? All right, now, to be honest, just based off the numbers provided here, I can already see what it's going to be. And it looks like it's going to be exponential and I'll show you why. If I set this as y is equal to 3 to the power of x, now this is just from, I guess, you know, all the practice and the relationships, you know, that you can tell from numbers after all, um, you know, this time doing math. But if you have a look, for this point here, when x is equal to 0, you'll have 3 to the power of 0, so therefore y is equal to 1. That's correct. What about when x is equal to 1? Oops. Let's now look at this point here. Well, that's easy. y is equal to 3 to the power of 1, which is 3. It's also correct. What about when x is equal to 2? And I'm sure you can tell. So what's y is equal to 3 squared? It's also 9. What about when y is equal to 3 cubed? It's 27. Okay, so it's these coordinates here that really helped me identify that it was an exponential and it's because I could tell that there was a relationship with, you know, 3 to the power of whatever that x is, it correlated back to those y coordinates. So the answer is D. Right, so question 13, 120 watt ceiling fan runs for 24 hours each day. If electricity is charged at 24.8 cents kilowatt hour, before I continue, I can already notice here, you know, that I've got different units. So this one here is watts and this one's kilowatts. What is the cost of running the ceiling fan for 30 days to the nearest cent? Okay, so what I'm first going to do is I'm going to determine how many watts I'm using over the 30 days. So it's 120 times 24 times 30. And that is... 86,000... 400 watts and I'm going to change this to kilowatts so I'm going to divide by 1000 so that's 86.4 kilowatts okay so that's how many kilowatts I'm using over the 30 days to determine the price I'm now going to multiply by 24.8 cents but before doing that I'm going to convert this to dollars so that's 0 0.248 dollars so now for your cost 86.4 kilowatts times 0 0.248 and that leaves me with uh, 21.43 rounded to the nearest cent so that's B. Question 14 which of the following walks is a path in the hmm, it says above network diagram so in the network diagram below okay I think that was just a typo if I'm just going to go through each one, so if I'm going to go from S to T and then back to S, okay, well, that's not a path because a path is um, has no repeated vertices, okay? B is S to T to U to V, okay, that looks good. Let's just double check with the rest. I've got S to T to V. Nope, that can't happen. It's not along the network. And then last I've got S to T to U to V T S. Well, then that's a circuit. So my answer is B. So my answer is B. Okay, last question. Otis obtained a personal loan of $30,000. He made a deposit of $2,200 and he agreed to pay $820 a month for four years. What is the total amount paid for the loan? Well, this is really straightforward. I just want to know how much of a contribution did he make over the lifetime of the loan. So I pay $820 a month over four years times 12. So really, because this is per month, okay, because this is per month, I need to change this here to months as well. And that leaves me with $39,360. Now, you may be quick to jump and say that the answer is C, but I made an initial deposit. Sorry, Otis made an initial deposit of $2,200. So really what he paid in total is the $2,200 plus the $39,360 over the four years. So he pays a total of $41,560 over the life of the loan. So that's D. 
Right, so that's the end of multiple choice. Let's start on section two. Okay, for question 16, the first three chapters in the textbook have pages in the ratio of 3 to 2 to 5. If there are 24 pages in the smallest chapter, how many pages are in the first three chapters of this textbook? Well, so I'm going to write out my ratio here. So chapter 1 is made up of three parts, chapter 2 is two parts, and chapter 3 is made out of five parts. The total parts... 3 plus 2 plus 5 so I've divided the first three chapters essentially into 10 parts okay now I know my smallest chapter is obviously this one here which makes up two parts and this is 24 pages in total so I asked myself this how did 2 become 24 where I can only multiply or divide you know with my ratios it works like fractions so that's the relationship here so I asked myself how did 2 become 24 well, I multiplied by 12, and so that's what I need to do to each of these other terms. So what's 3 times 12? It's 36. What's 5 times 12? It's 60. So your total number of pages in the first three chapters is 36 plus 24 plus 60, and that leaves you with 120 pages. Okay, so you would get a mark for identifying this and then a mark for your correct answer okay part b the ratio of the number of pages of the first three chapters to the whole book is 5 to 12 how many pages are in uh, how many pages are there in the whole book so this is now uh first three chapters to whole book so i know my first three chapters is 120 pages okay and oops pardon me one second so it's in the ratio of 5 to 12 and i know my first three chapters are actually 120 pages so once again let's see how did 5 become 120 120 divided by 5 is 24 so we've multiplied by 24 here which is what i need to do on this side as well so therefore, for the entire book, it's made up of 12 times 24, which is 288 pages in total. Okay, question 17. What is the value of A plus B over A times B if these are the values of your A and B? Okay, so this is just straight substitution. So I've got minus 3.1 plus minus 2.2 over minus 3.1 times minus 2.2 and I've put them in brackets here and this is exactly how I want you to input this onto your calculator okay and that leaves us with minus 0 0.777712 and so on but it wants the answer correct to two decimal places, so that rounds off to rounds to minus zero point seven eight. Okay, for two marks there. Question eighteen. Jane is flying a kite that is attached to a string of length 80 meters. The kite flies, okay, in the 80 meters is um, in the diagram. The kite flies at an angle of elevation of 55 degrees from Jane's eye level. How high to the nearest meter is the kite above Jane's eye level? Okay, so I've got a right angle triangle here. I have an angle that's known and a side that's known. So I can obviously apply the rules of Sokatoa, so my basic trig ratios. Height here is the opposite, over here is the adjacent, and this one here is the hypotenuse. So I have opposite and the hypotenuse, I'm going to use the sine, uh, the sine ratio. So it's sine 55 is equal to h over 80. I'm going to need to bring that 80 over to the other side so it multiplies. So it's 80 sine 55 is equal to h. So therefore, h is equal to... 65.53 and so on but it wants the answer to the nearest meter so that leaves me with 66 meters okay 
Question 19. The solid shown is made up of a closed cylinder and the hemisphere. What is the total volume? Okay, so I'm just going to write on the side here my formula. So you've got your formula for a hemisphere is half of that of an actual sphere. So it's half of 4 thirds pi r cubed. And your volume of your cylinder is simply cross-sectional area times height, where in this case your cross-sectional area is the circle. Okay, so therefore for your total volume, your volume is simply going to be, I'll start with the hemisphere, half times 4 thirds times pi times uh, r. Okay, so my radius is going to be 9.5 centimeters. So times 9.5 cubed plus my cross-sectional area, which is, just highlight that. Sorry, I'm just making it a bit clear. That area there of the circle. So it's pi r squared. Oops, I'll just write it. So it's pi r squared h. So it's... pi times 9.5 squared times and then your height of your cylinder is this one here 21 plug that all into your calculator you get 7749.785 and so on but the uh, you can leave it to whatever decimal points in this case you can round up to the nearest whole nearest one nearest two decimal points when the question doesn't specify you can do whatever you want you just have to state what you've done so I'm going to round it to two decimal places, so that's 7,749.79 cubic centimetres. Do not forget the units. Okay. Question 20. A box of candy contains 8 white and 15 milk chocolates. Bilal takes one chocolate at random and eats it. Nathan also takes a chocolate and eats it. By drawing the probability tree diagram or otherwise, find the probability that Bilal and Nathan eat different types of chocolate. Okay, so I'm going to go with, say, uh, we've got white chocolate, milk chocolate, white chocolate, milk chocolate, white chocolate, milk chocolate. Now, this is, say, if Bilal was picking, and here is oh, if Nathan were to draw. Okay, so that's how I'm taking this. So over here, I've got there is a 8 on 23 chance of getting selected. Where is it? Here it's 15 on 23. Then after having eaten a white chocolate, there is now 7 on 22 in this case. But there are still 15 milks left over, but now only 22 chocolates to select from. Likewise here, if milk was first selected, now there are still 8 whites out of 22 though, and here it's 14 out of 22. Okay, so my outcomes are white, 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 milk, milk, white, and milk, milk. The question is, find the probability that Bilal and Nathan eat different types of chocolate. So I want these outcomes. So I want the probability of white and milk plus the probability of milk white. So that looks like uh, 8 over 23 times 15 over 22 plus 15 over 23 times 8 over 22. And that leaves me with, let's plug that in on the calculator. Okay, so that's 120 over 253. So to get the two marks here, you would have needed to identify these two outcomes and at least state those two probability outcomes. That would have given you the one mark and then for your second mark is obviously providing the answer. Question 21, the area of the triangle is shown and it's 250 square centimeters. What is the value of X to the nearest whole number? Well, I know with a non-right angle triangle, your area of a non-right angle triangle is half AB sine C, where this is the angle bound by the two sides. 
so if I know 44 degrees therefore I'm going to be using these two sides okay so it's those two sides that are uh, the, the 44 degrees is bound by and I know in this case area is 250 so subbing in what I know I've got 250 is equal to half times 30 times x times sine 44 let's bring this half over to the other side so I'm going to divide by half and that leaves me with 500 uh, 500 is equal to 30 x sine 44 now to get x on its own I'm going to divide this 500 by 30 sine 44 so it's going to be 500 over 30 sine 44 once again the 30 and the sine 44 are being multiplied on this side so over on the other side it will divide and that leaves me with x plug that into your calculator and you get 23.99 and it wants it rounded up to the nearest whole number so x is 24 centimeters right question 22 we've got the network diagram below it shows the distances between seven villages in a valley complete the table to represent the network this is very easy two marks to get in the exam so quite straightforward as well obviously your two your two vertices don't have a connecting edge so you can see with aa bb cc dd and obviously ee ff and gg there are going to be no edges so no length there okay if I say I wanted to go from D to E let's have a look here's D and I want to go to E so going across okay so that is 52 if I say I wanted to go from F to E okay cool that's 19 let me see I just want to oh what about this one what about going what about between F to D does that exist so just rub these ones out if I'm oops, if I am here at F and I want to get to D is there a connecting edge there no there isn't okay so also at this one I would put a dash fill out the rest very quickly All right, and you can go back and check those as well. All right, now describe the shortest path between F and D and calculate its distance. So with this, it is going to require you to do um, some trial and error to you actually find the correct path. Now I have the luxury of, you know, using a highlighter and I can rub it out. What I do recommend is in the exam, you actually bring in a pen, a colored pen, but the ones that can be erased. So it's really good to see your edges outlined okay it really helps but when you are let's say I had drawn this path and then say I had drawn this path on top do you see how it's really difficult to then differentiate between the two so rubbing them out as you go along either use a pencil but the reason why I do or, or, or a pen but the reason why I do recommend the colored pens is just so it's more popping okay it's more striking so let's first start with so I'm going where am I going from again between F and D so here Okay, so if I went down, just do something quite basic there, and we've got, let's plug that in, 32 plus 25 plus 13. So if I go from F to A to B to D, that gives me 70. All right, let's try another one. Obviously, going down this path here is way too large is 72 okay I wouldn't say way too large but it's much bigger let's say 19 and 52 that's 71 too big let's see so I've yet to find one that's a smaller um, all right what about 32 33 and 30 well they're already that's already too big because 33 and 30 are bigger than your 25 and 13 so not going to bother there what about just making sure I haven't missed anything 
Okay, so instead of going up 32, what if I went down 19? Let me do a different color. What if I went down 19? And then instead of going across 52, because that's too big, so I'll choose 21. And then in, if I did 30, that's quite, that could work, but I can see an even shorter path. Do you see here I've got 16 and 13? Now 16 and 13 together makes 29, which is less than that 30. So let's add that one up. 19 plus 21 plus 16 plus 13. Oh, amazing, 69. Look at that, it was just one off. Okay, and there are just no other outcomes where it's going to be less than that. So your path is F to E to G to B to D, and it's 69. And in this case, does it say what units we're working with? No, it says just units. Okay. So question 23, the measurements on the house pan below are in millimeters. What is the perimeter of the house of the house plan? Okay, well, this is really straightforward. So I just need to find the length, total length of all of these edges. Now I can add up each one of those uh, edges, you know, the ones that are highlighted, or I can look at it this way. Can you see that this one here, which is 9,000 millimeters also, makes up a total of 9,000 on the other side as well as, so let's choose another color, say oops, these two little green ones are the same length as this green length here okay so that total length here is 7,800 millimeters Right, so this one's quite straightforward to find the perimeter. I'll just need to do 9,000 times 2 plus 7,800 times 2. And you get, plug that in on your calculator, 33,600 millimeters. Okay, part B, what is the area of the bedroom labeled bed in square meters? Now it's asking for square meters, so what I'm going to do is change my dimensions to meters. So if I've got 5,400, oh, first of all, let's identify what the area, uh, what the bed, what area we're after. We're after this area here, and I'm going to break this down into two areas. So I've got area one in pink and area two in blue. So I'm going to change my dimensions. This is actually uh, 5.4 meters. Okay. And if I want to find this side length here, remember this whole length is 9,000 millimeters. Okay. And I know over here is 4,200 millimeters. So I just need to subtract the two and I get 4,800 millimeters, which is the same as 4.8 meters. Okay. I just find it so much easier to just convert it to the to the units that we're after straight away and then for my second area in pink let's find out what the dimensions are so looking here I know this length here is 4200 millimeters and then this length here is 4000 millimeters so now I've got 200 millimeters here which is the same as 0 0.2 meters okay and this length here is 2400 so it's uh, 2.4 meters this is straightforward your total area so I'll start with area 1 area 1 is 2.4 by 0 0.2 which is 0 0.48 area 2 mind you you could have written this out just in the one step it's 5.4 by 4.8 that gives me 25.92 so your total area is going to be 26.4 square meters. Okay, now the reason why this one here is worth three marks is because we needed to identify first the composite shape. So we needed to break this up into my two areas. And then the second part was converting the units. Okay, maybe most of the students would have left it first in millimeters and then probably made some incorrect uh, conversions at the end. At any point, it's fine to make those changes as long as it's that right conversion. Okay, 
question C. Maria decides... Question three. Marie, uh, question C. Maria decides the floor of the bedroom is to be covered with square tiles. The tiles measure 30 by 20 centimetres. That's interesting. Um, I don't know what they intended there. But anyway, um, again, I don't know if in the actual exam they would have made a note of this um, to their students. I don't know if it's a typer, but we've got here the tiles measure 30 centimeters by 20 centimeters. Let's just go with the dimensions. Um, if you ever came across, you know, a typer in the exam, the schools do make the relative adjustments. But anyway, so we've got square tiles. The tiles measure 30 by 20 centimeters. How many tiles will we need to tile the bedroom? Well, we've got our answer in part B in square meters. So I'm actually going to do the same thing and convert these units to meters as well. So my tiles are actually zero point the area of the tiles are 0 0.3 by 0 0.2 so that's 0 0.6 square meters oh sorry 0. Point, sorry 0 0.06 square meters and now I'm going to find out how many of these I need to fill up 26.4 so number of tiles needed I'm going to divide so 26.4 divided by 0 0.06 and we get 440 tiles. Question 24. Samuel owns a credit card that has no annual fees and charges a flat rate. So flat rate, this relates to simple interest of 18.25% per annum on all purchases. Find the interest charge on $1,800 for 15 days. Answer correct to the nearest cent. Well, I can already see that here I'm dealing with days, but this right here is per annum. So what I'll first do is, is change this rate. So my R, which is 18.25%, is change it to a daily rate. So this is 18.25 over 365%. So if I wanted to find, what's it asking? Find the interest. So my interest is simply going to be 1,800 times my rate, so 18.25 over 365% times 15 days. Okay, and we get 13.5, so in dollars, that's $13.50. Right, for question 25, a new piece of equipment is purchased by business for $80,000. Its value is depreciated each month using the graph below. What is the equation of the straight line in terms of V and T? Okay, so you can see those units there. Now, here, it's in the thousands. So this actually means 20,000, 40,000, 60,000, 80,000, and so on. I'm going to be using Y equals MX plus B to determine the equation of this line. And because it is depreciating, and you can see here, it's negatively sloped, okay? Um, you, we're just going to have to remember to put in that negative there for my gradient. Okay, so for the gradient, I'm going to identify two very easy points. And what I mean by easy, like I know for sure that those are the coordinates. Like for example, if I were to pick this point here, the T value is definitely 8. But do you see how it's really hard for me to determine what that corresponding V value is? So I would not pick this point. Sorry. What I would do is, is use those two, okay, to determine the rise over the run. Okay, so you can see I have sort of like a triangle going on here, not sort of an actual triangle going on here, and I can determine the rise over the run. So you can see the rise is 80 and the run is 40. Okay, now do not worry about this thousand because remember I will be dividing so they will cancel out anyway. So it is 80 over 40 which is 2 but remember it's negatively sloped so I have to put that minus there. I'm not saying 80 divided by 40 is negative 2, that's just something I put in extra to determine the type of slope it is. And your y-intercept which is your b, so this is your y-intercept, that is 80. Okay, and we know B is equal to 80. So plugging that in, I've got V is equal to minus 2T plus 80. Okay, 
question 26. Solve the following pairs of equations simultaneously. So I've got equation 1 and equation 2. Just by observation, I'm going to do the elimination method. Okay, so I'm going to multiply equation 2 by 5 because I'm going to eliminate 5. Uh, sorry, I'm going to eliminate the x's. So I'll do equation 2 times by 5, so that leaves me with 5x plus 2y is equal to 16, which is still my equation 1. But my new equation for equation 2 is now 5x minus 5y is equal to minus 5. And this is now equation 3. I'm then going to subtract both equations. Okay. So we're going to do equation 1 take away equation 3 and that leaves me with, you can see 5x take away 5x cancels. Now I've got 2y minus minus 5y, so that's the same as 2y plus 5y, so 7y is equal to 16 minus minus 5y, which is 21. So now I've got y is equal to 3. I'm just going to pop that in a box to make it clear to the marker what my answer is. And then I'm just going to sub into any of the equations. I'm just going to sub into equation 2. It doesn't matter which one I sub into, 1, 2, or 3. But 2 looks the neatest. So now I'm going to sub y equals 3 into equation 2. And that leaves me with x minus 3 is equal to minus 1 plus 3 on both sides. So x is equal to 2. Question 27, Benny takes out a loan of $58,000 borrowed at 6% per annum compounding monthly and makes regular payments of $810 a month. Show that the recurrence relation to model the situation is as follows. So what this means, my V of N plus 1, so this is relating to the amount owing after interest and a repayment has been made. So really, all you need to do in this case is simply show how they get this 0.005. Now, I know my rate is 6% per annum. And you can see in previous examples, I do leave them as a fraction because I know I'm just going to plug it in straight away onto a calculator. But let's convert this um, into monthly and then into decimals. So as a monthly rate, it's 6 over 12%. Plug that in on your calculator and you get 0 0.005. Okay, so that's taking in the percentage as well. So now we're just going to plug that in. Okay, if you want to just be on the safe side, you know, you say this is the repayment. This is the interest charged. Okay, so this is the interest charged and added. Okay, and this is the amount owing, and this is now the new amount owing. Right, for question B, what is the balance of the loan after he has made two payments? Give your answer to the nearest cent. All right, so I know after my, after the first month, well, first of all, I owe $58,000. OK, at the end of the first month, it would have been charged interest. And this comes from, sorry, this one point, so one point zero 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 five. Sorry. Ah. Apologies. So this one point zero zero five simply comes from the one plus zero point zero zero five. Okay, so you've got your $58,000 that I owe, get slapped with interest, added on top, and then I come along and I make a repayment. Okay, plug that in your calculator and you get $57,480. So at the end of the first month, I now owe $57,480. So even though I made a repayment of $810, my loan only went down by $520. Okay, so you can see because the interest there obviously played a factor. In my second month, I now owe this much. I then get charged interest and it gets added on top, but I also make a repayment. So this is now $56,957.40. Question 28. John cycles around a course. The course starts at D passes through C, B, A, and then back to D. Okay, so he does that. Now, 
I never miss reading these questions. I always read them and try and match them up with the actual diagram because sometimes they're actually quite sneaky and they put in extra information in the question that isn't actually marked on the diagram. So just be careful. I've also been told that AB and AD are equal. Great, that's been marked on the diagram. What is the length of CD to the nearest kilometer? So I'm after this length here in blue. I can also, so looking at triangle, so I'm looking at triangle BCD. I can identify that this angle here is 55 degrees. That's just from angle sum of a triangle. So I added 87 and 38 and I took it away. Yeah, I'll write this down here. Angle CBD is equal to 55 degrees. Sorry, it comes from 180. So I'll just make it clear for you. Angle CBD is equal to 180 minus 38 plus 87 okay and you get 55 degrees so now in I'm looking at triangle BCD in that triangle I'm going to use the sine rule okay I have a known pair which is those two and then CD the opposite angle to CD is 55 so this is quite straightforward it's just going to be CD over sine 55 is equal to 50 over sine 87 bring this sine 55 up to here so it multiplies that leaves me with CD is equal to 50 sine 55 remember on the left hand side so on this side it's being divided by so on this side it will on the other side it will times divided by sine 87 so therefore CD is equal to 41.01 kilometers but the answer wants it to the nearest kilometer 41 kilometers it's so disappointing that if you actually don't read this last part of the question you could lose a mark and they're just not worth it so be really careful you could have also used the cosine rule if you like i can show you how we go about using the cosine rule how could i just um rub this out so to be clear, this is still 55 degrees, of course. Okay, so again, I'm still finding this side. So if you had used the cosine rule, that's CD squared is equal to 30 squared plus uh, 50 squared. As you can see, 55 is the angle bound between 30 and 50. Minus 2 times 30 times 50, ah, uh, cos 55. Okay, plug that all in on your calculator, then find the square root, and you would get, get the same answer. What is the total distance John cycles to the nearest kilometer? Okay, so this whole idea of whichever, what path you know he took is relevant. So I now know that this one here is 41 kilometers. So I need to find this length here in blue. So I have 41, I have 30. Okay, but I need AB and AD, but they're equal. And you can see, okay, let's pick another color. You can see this triangle is actually a right angle triangle and I have the hypotenuse so I'm going to use Pythagoras theorem Pythagoras theorem so using okay I'm going to label them X so if one of them is X so is the other you've got x squared plus x squared is equal to 50 squared so 2x squared is equal to 2500 I'm now going to divide both sides by 2 x squared is equal to 1250 x is equal to the square root of 1250 and so therefore x is equal to 35.355 so if I want now the total distance, it's simply going to be 41 plus 30 plus your two x's there. So total distance is 31 plus 40 plus 2 times 35.355. Plug that in on your calculator and you get 141.7206. And rounding that off to the nearest kilometer, you get 142 mm -hmm. kilometers. Okay, for question 29, Adam throws a ball and it takes four seconds for it to reach the ground. The height it reaches is given by the formula H is equal to minus T squared plus 4T, where H is the height and T is time in seconds. Looking at this, I can establish that this is a parabola. Okay, when my highest power of one of my variables is 2. 
Okay, part A is complete the following table of values. This is really straightforward. I'm just doing straight substitution. So I'm just going to fill out those values really quickly. And if you want, how about I show you an example, just so you know how I went about it. So for example, when t is equal to 2, and you would just plug this straight onto your calculator, you get h is equal to minus 2 squared plus 4 times 2, which is minus 4 plus 8, which is 4. Okay, then it's asking to draw this graph. Okay, so I'm just going to plot in my values. So I've got at 0, 0, how about 1, 3, 2, 4, 3, 3, and at 4, 0. Can you see the shape that it's going to turn into? Ah, sorry, went a bit wonky at the end there. Got a parabola. Okay. Part C, what is the maximum height of the ball uh, uh, reached by the ball? That's really easy. That's that point here. So it's four meters. Do not forget your units. When is the maximum height reached? Well, that occurs at two seconds. Okay, for question 30, the network diagram below shows the cost to lay pipes to a certain part of a garden. Draw a minimum spanning tree that will ensure all the parts of the gardens are connected by pipes, but also minimizes the amount of pipes required. Okay, so it's just adding the definition there of your minimum spanning tree. I like to use Prim's method, but you know, you can use cross cows as well. I like to, with Prim's method, you know, I just select any random point. I'm just going to say start with A. And based on this vertice here, I look at all the connecting edges and see which one is the least. So in this case, 105 is the least. Now I have A and B as my vertices to look at and I need to determine between A and B the edges that come out of those vertices which one is the least and it is 121. Now I need to look at vertices A, oh sorry, vertices A, B and D and out of A, B and D which one has the smallest edge and that is 123 and then you can see here i have to incorporate now c let's see which one is the smallest edge coming out that's 103 and 113 okay and you can see now every single one of my vertices okay has been connected and now you just need to draw it Okay, so just have a look at that there. All right, and then part B, what is the minimum cost of all pipes connected, uh, th uh, that connects all the parts of the garden? Okay, so I just need to add up all those edges there and you get 105 plus 121, sorry, plus 123. 103 plus 113 and that leaves you with 565 dollars question 31 okay we have an annuities question so we've got the table gives the present value of an annuity of a dollar at the given interest rate for the given period right jesse plans to invest 7500 dollars every year for eight years okay so i'm now going to take these amounts uh, so these terms as years okay um, his investment will return an interest rate of six percent per annum beautiful you can see now you know this is per annum and I'm dealing with years I don't have to change any of these um, they're within the same not unit but you know what I mean within that same time frame that I'm looking at calculate the present value of his annuity okay so let's find out what the intersection is I've got 6% per annum over the 8 years. So I can see here that the intersection is occurring at 6.2098. So therefore it's just going to be 6.2098 times 7,500. So that is $46,573.50. So that may, what this means, okay, just so you understand the context behind it, if you don't understand, you know, how annuities works, if somebody were to invest $7,500 every year for eight years where it actually accumulates interest along the way, it's going to grow, 
okay? That amount that it grows to is the equivalent of investing $46,573.50 at the start and letting that grow over the eight years and you'll end up with the same amount at the end. Part B, Sean, I think that Sean takes out a loan of $12,000 to buy a car. This loan is to be repaid over five years at an interest rate of 8% per annum. Use the present value annuity table to find his yearly repayments. So we're going to, let's have a look, we're at five years, 8% per annum. Five years, 8% per annum, so it is... 5.99 uh, 3.9927 what this means so what i need to determine of this $12,000 uh, sorry pardon me i just got a bit tongue tied so if i'm taking out the loan and this time i want to find the repayment in this case i'm going to divide okay i'm going to say let the repayment be x so we've got um, 3.9927x is equal to 12,000. So therefore, x is equal to 12,000 over 3.9927 to my both sides. And that leaves me with 3,000, get the gist. And so that rounds off to $3,005.49. Thirty-two. A biologist assumes that there is a linear relationship between the amount of fertilizer supplied to tomato plants and the subsequent yield of tomatoes obtained. Eight tomato plants of the same variety were selected at random and treated weekly with a solution in which X grams of fertilizer was dissolved in a fixed quantity of water. The yield in Y kilograms of tomato was recorded. Okay. All right, so we've got that data here. It's asking for part A. Use the scatter plot to describe the association between the yield and fertilizer in terms of strength and direction. Okay, so obviously I'm going to use that here. Okay, you know, we've got R is equal to 0 0.94535. So if I wanted to find out what Pearson's correlation is, I would just find the square root of that. And that is 0 0.9722. I mean, even just by observation, you can tell it is a strong, um, a strong relationship, but this further confirms it. Okay, so it's definitely strong. And is it positive or negative? Well, it's positively sloped. Okay, this way is positive way is negative it's increasing strong positive linear correlation Sorry, correlation where the more fertilizer fertilizer provided Okay, excuse my handwriting, <laughs> increases the yield. Part B, determine the equation of the least squares regression line for this data, round your value to two significant figures. Okay, let's plug this all in. Okay, now before we put in any type of data, we always have to clear our calculator. So we need to do shift nine to clear it. Press number three equals okay and clear all of that so I'm going to go to mode uh, stat and then number two okay, I'm going to plug in all that data so I've got one, one, one. okay now that I've plugged all of that in I'm then going to clear the calculator press shift one I'll go to and press number five and I want to get A and B. Okay, so first I'll get A 
and that's 2.59208 and so on. Then I'm going to go back and get B, number 2, and that's 1.43718 and so on. And then I'm going to put it in the form of, you know, what we clicked here on our calculator, the A plus B X form. Remembering here on your calculator, when I went into mode, stat, do you see here how it's in the form of y, uh, not y, it was A plus B X, okay? So this is giving me my equation of least squares regression line in this form. So that's why I'm finding A and finding B, and then I just substitute it into that form. Okay, for part C, a plant with 2.2 grams of fertilizer was not recorded by accident. So calculate the predicted yield for this plant using your answer in part B. So I know Y is equal to 1.4 plus 2.6X. Okay, remember it's just a prediction and you know this equation um, of least squares regression line, you know, gives us an estimate for what these values are inside or outside the, the data range. So when X is equal to 2.2, y which is your predicted yield is 1.4 plus 2.6 times 2.2 plug that in your calculator it's relatively straightforward it's 5.68 kilograms explain why you should not extrapolate from this data to find the yield for high rates of fertilizer usage okay so you may have several answers here take a moment to think about it Okay, so you may have several answers here. We can... All right, so you may have several answers here. It's one mark, so as an indicator, one factor may be, uh, one factor may be just enough. Now I want you to think about it. Obviously it looks like, let's go back to our graph, the more fertilizer I provide, the higher the yield. But don't you think there is such thing as too much fertilizer could actually be harmful? You know, sometimes if something uh, overdoing it can actually in turn harm something. So we shouldn't extrapolate data. So extrapol um, extrapolated data is data outside of the sample. So if I will say looking anywhere out here or out here, okay, and so on. Okay, so if I was looking at, say, fertilizer of 4 grams, 5 grams, 6 grams, 7 grams, you see how that's outside of the data range? So, coming back here, I would say something along the lines of um, high volume of fertilizer may cause damage. To the plant so in this case even though we ha I have a higher uh, higher rate of fertilizer I'm probably not going to get a higher yield another factor is sunlight okay um, or water water for the plants may or may not be available available or able to absorb the fertilizer at that rate okay maybe we don't have to say about not being available but um you know that could be something completely external okay question 33 <laughs> Perth in Western Australia is eight hours ahead of Greenwich in England. Santiago is three hour, uh, Santiago in Chile is three hours behind Greenwich. Okay, what I always like to do is I just like to see it visually, you know, so here's Greenwich. Okay, we've got Western Australia is eight hours ahead. So you've got Perth in Western Australia is eight hours ahead. And we've got Santiago in Chile is three hours behind. Okay, so this is Santiago and Chile, three hours behind. Now looking at that, I can tell that there is 11 hours between the two cities where you, we could look at this and say Perth is 11 hours ahead of Santiago or Santiago is 11 hours behind. All right, let's see what the question is asking. So it's saying, what is the day and time in Perth when it is 8 p.m. on Thursday in Santiago? So 
not Friday, 7 a.m. on a Friday. Question 34. When a force is applied to a certain object, its acceleration A varies inversely as its mass. When acceleration of an object is 12 meters per second squared, the corresponding mass is 3 kilos. Okay, so I've been given a condition. Okay, so when the acceleration is 12, the corresponding mass is 3. And this is going to help. What I'll first do is, is write out what my variation is. So I've got, you know, when something is inversely proportional. So in this case, it's my acceleration is inversely proportional to my mass. I've been given a condition, so I've been told, so I can write this as a is equal to k over m. I've been told when acceleration is 12, my mass is 3. Let's sum that in. You get 12 is equal to k over 3. Let's bring this 3 up here by multiplying, so you get 36 is equal to k. So therefore, oh, that's what it wants. It wants the constant, okay? thought it wanted the equation. All right, the next part, find the acceleration of a 1.5 kilogram object. So if I now have my equation A is equal to 36 over M, when my mass is 1.5 kilograms, what is acceleration? So A is simply 36 over 1.5, which is equal to 24 meters per second squared. Please don't forget the units. Find the mass of an object when acceleration is 6 meters per second squared. So once again, I have my <laughs> equation of acceleration. When acceleration is equal to 6, let's sub that in, you get 6 is equal to 36 over m. Now, be careful here. I'm going to do two steps. I'll first bring this m up here. You may do this in one step. You may be able to see. I'm just going to break it down. This is now 6m is equal to 36. So this m on this side is being divided by. On the other side, it will multiply. And now I'm going to divide both sides by 6. So you've got m is equal to 36 over 6, which is 6. Okay, question 35. Malik's normal rate of pay is 1975 an hour. In one week he works 17 hours at a normal rate, 7 hours at time and a half and 2 hours at double time. He has also worked he was also paid a wet weather allowance of 65 bucks a week. Beautiful. What was his total earnings for the week? Okay, so his total earnings. This is quite an easy question. We've got his it's 1975 an hour and he did 17 of those hours at a normal rate. He then did uh, seven hours at time and a half. He also did uh, two hours at double time. Plus, plus he was paid $65 okay, for wet weather allowance. Plug that all in onto your calculator and you get $687.13 rounded off. Aniket has earned a gross annual salary of $82,500 in 2019 to 2020 and his employer has paid $26,400 in PAYG tax on his behalf. Aniket has calculated that his total allowable deductions were 1,130 for work-related events, 220 for stationary, 460 for union fees, uh, and 460 for union fees. Aniket must pay the Medicare level of Medicare level of 2% on his taxable income. Using the tax table provided by the ATO below, determine how much Aniket's tax refund or tax liability is. Remembering throughout the year, he has actually been paying tax, okay? His employer has been making the contributions from his pay, okay? Not out of the goodwill of the employer. So out of Aniket's pay, he's contributed $26,400 already. We want to find out if he's paid more in tax or under. Okay, let's first... Factor in the deductions, so his taxable income, his taxable income is 82,500 minus 
1,130 minus 220 minus 460. And that leaves me with $80,690. So he falls in this bracket. All right. So he must pay $3,572 plus 32 and a half cents for every dollar he's over 37 grand. Let's find out how much he is over. So let's do $80,690, take away the $37,000, and we get $43,690. So that means tax payable is $3,572 plus um, 32, oops, sorry about that, 2.5 cents of the 43,690. Plug that into your calculator and you get he must pay $17,771 in tax. He must also make a Medicare levy contribution and his Medicare levy, let me just write this down, Remember, his Medicare levy is 2% of his taxable income. So let's also calculate that. It's 2% of his taxable income, so of 80690 And that is $1,613.80. So that means total tax that he should pay in the entire year is $17,771.25 plus his Medicare levy, which is $19,385.05. Now he's paid $26,400 already. So he will get a tax refund. So we get a tax refund and you need to state that because the question was asking, does he get a tax refund or is there a liability? So he'll get a tax refund of 26,400 minus 19,385 and five cents. Ah, just fitting that in of $7,014 and 95 cents. Okay, question 37. The birth weight of babies born in Australia during 2019 is presented in the following box and whisker diagram. With your box and whisker diagram, remember that each section here represents a quarter of my data. Okay, so we've got what is the weight of the heaviest baby? So that's this here. Remember these two. This one here represents your lowest score. This one here is your highest score. Over here is your median. And this is your Q1, your Q3. This is Q2. So your median is also your Q2. Okay, what is the weight of the heaviest baby? That's this here. Let's see, what am I going up by each time? Looks like I'm going up by 0 0.2. So that means it is 4. Point, yeah, 4.6 kilograms. Find the interquartile range. So your interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. So Q3 is 3.6 and Q1 is 3. So it's going to be 3.6 minus 3, which is 0 0.6 kilograms. Calculate the upper limit for the outliers of this data set. Okay, so for the upper, that means I'm concerned with the one past Q3. So it's going to be Q3, and this is on your formula sheet, plus 1.5 times your interquartile range, which is 3.6 plus 1.5 times 0 0.6, and that gives me 4.5 kilograms. So my upper limit for any outlier to exist will be up to 4.5. Describe the shape of the distribution of the weight. Okay, I can see that the majority of my scores are quite heavy on this side. Okay, so that means, do you see here, you know, from here to here, it's quite spread. And then, you know, they're quite crammed up here. So 75% of my data lies here. Okay, so that means it is negatively skewed. If your data... Okay. 
was this way it's positively skewed and if your data is uh, quite low and then whoops sorry okay and then heavy on the other side it's negatively skewed Question 38. Janet has three bottles of beer over two and a half hours. Three bottles of beer over two and a half hours. A bottle of beer is 0 0.8 standard drinks and she weighs 56 kilograms. The formula to calculate her blood alcohol content is given by this. Okay. N is the number of standard drinks consumed. H is the number of hours um, of drinking. And M is the person's mass in kilograms. Calculate Janet's blood alcohol content after two and a half hours. So, pardon me. So your blood alcohol content is simply going to be 10 times, what does N stand for again? The number of standard drinks. And she had three times 0 0.8 standard drinks because each standard drink was 0 0.8 and she had three of those minus 7.5 times h where h is the number of hours she'd been drinking for which is two and a half hours divided by 5.5 times her mass which is 56 kilograms straight onto the calculator and you get 0 0.017 if Janet has no more alcohol, determine how much longer she must wait until her blood alcohol content returns to zero. Okay, so putting in that same data, but we're trying to figure out now what H is. We're, uh, we're trying to determine what H is and now my blood alcohol content is going to be zero. So she still drank. It's based off of this example that she still drank three bottles of beer with the standard uh 0.8 standard drink size so now I'm going to have 0 is equal to once again 10 times 3 times 0 0.8 minus 7.5 h all over 5.5 times 56 simplifying this you get 24 minus 7.5 h over 5.5 times 56 and that's equal to 0 if I were to bring this denominator, which is being divided by on this side onto this side, it multiplies, it would go to zero because zero times anything is zero. So now I'm left with zero is equal to 24 minus 7.5 H. I'm now going to bring this over to this side. So on this, on the right hand side, it's subtracting on the other side, it would add. So now I've got 7.5 H is equal to 24. Divide both sides by 7.5 and you get h is equal to 3.2 so she must wait a total of 3.2 hours until she is at zero blood alcohol content level right for question 39 the diagram shows the result of a compass radial survey of a triangular area of land okay in a radial survey remember these angles here are always relative to north Okay, it says find the angle of BOC. So angle BOC is BOC. So it wants this angle here, which is straightforward. Um, quite simply, it's just angle BOC is just 171 minus 78 degrees, which is 93 degrees. Okay, just as a little explanation, oops, as a little explanation if needed. I know that from here to here is 78 degrees and from here to here is 171. That's what the radial survey, um, that, that's what these angles on the radial survey describe. So therefore, if you wanted to find, say, this angle here in green, that's why I did 171 take away 78. Part B, find the length of BC to the nearest meter. BC, okay. Oh, that's really straightforward. I'm going to use the cosine rule because I now have the angle and two sides bound by that angle. And so it's going to be BC squared is equal to 32 squared plus 43 squared minus 2 times 32 times 43 cos 71. Plug that in onto your calculator. Okay, because
because we wanted it to the nearest meters, that's 55 meters. Question 14, it's the last question. The diagram below shows a survey of a land Alfred will build his house on. Use two applications of the trapezoidal rule to estimate the area of the land to the nearest square meter. So I'm going to take this as area one and area two. Now I know that this whole length here is 220. That means the height of each sub interval is 110. Got it? Okay, so therefore in this case, my height is 110 meters. And so for my first area, it's going to be height over two. So 110 over two, open bracket plus now over here, we've got at this point, it's 20. And at this point here, it's 90. And that is 6,050 square meters. For area two, it's 110 over two and that is 90 plus 150 and that is 13,200 square meters so your total area is simply 6,050 plus 13,200 which is a total of 19,250 square meters all right for the nav all right, for the next part, Alfred plans on grading the land so that it serves as a main catchment area for a pond at its lowest elevation. To maintain the water level in the pond, it is estimated that at least 10 megalitres of rain must flow into the pond each year. If 45% of that rain falls on the land, sorry, if 45% of the rain that falls on the land flows into the pond, calculate the amount of rainfall in millimeters must fall on the land each year to maintain the water level in the pond round to the nearest 10 millimeters. So if I've got, so I'm just having another read, if I've got 10 megalitres, so my volume here is my 10 megalitres, so my 10 million litres, this is the same as 10 thousand cubic meters okay where one cubic meter is a thousand liters okay that's okay now i know that 45 percent of the rain that falls on the land flows into the pond so this ten thousand cubic meters is how much water actually goes into the pond which is 45 percent of it so to find the total volume of rainfall I simply do 10,000 divided by 45%. If you want to understand why I did this, I know that 45% of my rain is 10,000 cubic meters. I can then find 1% of that. So I divide it by 45, divide both sides by 45, and you get 222.222 and so on. And then to get 100%, I'd multiply that by 100 and you'd get 22,222 and so on. Or you can just simply do 100, uh, 10,000 divided by 45%. Okay, that does those two steps in one. And that gives you a total volume of 22,222.22 uh, cubic meters. But I want to know how much of the, rain, uh, uh, the amount of rainfall in millimeters. So I want to know what that height is. So coming back to my volume is equal to A times height, my cross-sectional area times my height. I know that the volume is 22,222.22 and it's equal to my area which in the previous question was 19,250 and they're both in the same units, 19,250 square meters times the height. So I'm trying to find out what that is. I'm going to divide both sides by 19,250. And we get the height is 1,154, 4, 0, and so on. Uh, me, uh, oops, sorry, <laughs> pardon me, 1.154, so on meters. Let's change that to centimeters. So that's 115.44, yada, 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 centimeters in millimeters millimeters but the question wants to the nearest 10 millimeters so this rounds off to 1500 oh sorry 1100 my goodness my game brain's getting a bit foggy at the end of this exam 1150 millimeters all right and that's it guys the end of the paper 
I hope that made sense. If you need any help, please feel free to shoot over a question in the comments box or through the website. Um, good luck in your trials and I'll have other solutions uploaded shortly afterwards. So keep an eye out for more papers. Keep practicing. Don't give up. The more you do of these, the more that you are exposed to exam style questions, the better prepared you are for the exam. As long as you've done all your chapter reviews in your textbooks and just refreshed every single topic, you're ready to start looking at trial papers. The thing with trial papers is you get to see how they are worded in the exam. And you can see sometimes they are quite sneaky, particularly in the last lines. OK, so always these last lines, you know, where they're asking you to round those parts are the most frustrating where kids, you know, lose lose marks so just be careful and just make sure that we're really breaking down the question and understanding what the question is asking for again i'll say it again you need any help um please feel free to uh send me a message in the comments box if you enjoyed this video and found it helpful please don't forget to hit the subscribe button before you go and also check out our social media pages across all the platforms under ask cassie